Thank you, Guelph, uh, also for the invite. Um, it's really exciting to be here. As Nadia mentioned, uh, we had like 120 kilometer hour wind gusts last night. So the power was out for most of the morning, but everything seems to be back in order. But just in case, um, hopefully, fingers crossed, we won't run into any issues. Um, um, I'm present, going to be presenting uh, some of some of my uh, recent work, but some of the uh, and some of ongoing work and research that I've been doing for the past couple of years. Um, and this uh, title of the lecture is the title of a new upcoming book uh, to be published uh, in 2021. And I'll speak about it a little bit also um, as we uh, go through the presentation. Um, well, this might seem like a lifetime ago, uh, but if you recall, this is how 2020 started. <laughs> there was this uh, really wonderful article by the New York Times columnist Richard Flagan, where he said, right now on the outskirts of a hyper-modern first world metropolis at the end of a year in which the public seemed finally to wake up to the dram dramatic threat from global warming, a climate disaster of unimaginable horror has been unfolding for almost three full months. Uh, what accounts for the indifference, he asks. There are all the usual factors, the desire to look away, the, to avoid con contemplating the scariest aspects of contemporary life and the short-sightedness of the media's reluctance to cover climate disasters, at least as climate disasters. So in 2020 and every year before that for the past decade, it was a summer of record heat in Australia. Uh, this guy here is Scott Morrison, um, the Prime Minister of Australia waving around a lump of coal in Parliament during question period. And he said, don't be afraid, don't be scared, it won't hurt you, it's just coal. And with those words, Scott Morrison taunted the opposition attempting to ridicule a commitment to renewable energy. And all I could say is let's hope that this summer won't be as disastrous as the last. Um, this is an article literally just from a couple of days ago, November 10th. Um, and now 2020, as it comes to a close, it has become official that on this side of the planet, this year has now the most named storms ever recorded in the Atlantic in a single year. If you noticed, um, we've run out of the Latin alphabet and are now in theta of the Greek alphabet. <laughs> and on November 9, this tropical disturbance uh, gained enough strength to become a subtropical storm making it the 29th named storm, topping the 28th that formed in 2005. Um, the 2020 hurricane season started fast with the first nine storms arriving earlier than ever before. And the season has turned out to be one of the most active since 1953, thanks to the warmer, uh, warmer than usual water in the Atlantic. This image on the right, was taken on September 14, where there were five named storms uh, from left to right. It was Sally, Paulette, Renee, Teddy, and Vicky swirling in the Atlantic simultaneously. Um, and you know what? Every year we break records and somehow the amnesia between fire season and hurricane season seems to settle in depending on when the storm, when, is, when, it, when the media is picking up the narrative. Um, you know, this these, um, uh, there were four category four hurricanes that hit last year, Harvey, Irma, Maria, and Michael. That's the most in 150 year record that's hitting the Atlantic shore, uh, sorry, the North American shorelines. These are the same storms that sort of decimated Puerto Rico, down parts of Houston, rattled most of Florida, and triggered another record uh, set of damages at $300 billion, eclipsing um, you know, every uh, year the, the kind of records that we've seen from the year before it. Um, the reason why I think this is important is because um, at the same time, today, half of, today about half of the world's population live within 100 kilometers of an estuary where eight out of the 10 largest metropolitan regions are currently situated. That is roughly 5 billion people that live at the point where biodiversity is really, really rich and the earth is extremely productive. It is the kind of ground that is neither wet nor dry, but has always been and will be in a state of constant flux or a terra sorda firma, as I like to call it. And we've always lived in these conditions, you know, from the ancient Nile River deltas to the world's most populous cities like Shanghai and New York, and from Venice to New Orleans, people once mastered living on these terra sorda firmas. And let us not forget that even, um, you know, Canada's largest city, um, the downtown core is straddled between the mouths of two rivers, the Humber and the Don. Uh, 
Um, so it's no coincidence that, you know, even, even uh, in multiple scales and in places where you don't think of yourselves as, um, as, as, as Delta conditions are very much, many of our cities are in such a situation. Um, taking a look to pre-industrialization, water and environmental processes have been integrated into the urban and regional form. And this integration took into account large scale systems that created these kind of unique city forms that were appropriate for their specific location. Many times we like to look at these uh, Dutch <laughs> precedents uh, as appropriate and not appropriate as they may be, but they've uh, created these really sophisticated systems of drainage, agriculture, urban settlements, and land subdivisions that have been in place for over 800 years. Where the low-lying tracts of land, roads, fields, and waterways were kind of enclosed by the unique work that formed these integrated urban landscape and hydrological nexuses. So every single one of those cities that I mentioned earlier, or settlements, if you want to even call them cities, uh, consist um, were and um, operated on this premise that in order to live on and in those landscapes, those settlements needed to first slow and absorb water to prevent flooding rather than dispose of it as fast as possible. Its infrastructure, infrastructure needed to retain, purify, and improve the quality of that water. And in that process, create net positive ecosystem services while also activating the social public realms through the coupling of civic, economic, and performative uses. So what went wrong? Knowing that we've mastered living in these contexts for millennia, why are we why are cities today increasingly challenged to adapt to climate change? Um, the first reason um, is, you know, is in addition to the kind of compounding effects of climate change um, on, our, on our waterways and on our oceans, the first reason is that between 1950 and 2030, urbanization patterns have dramatically shifted. The rate of this growth is unprecedented, where it's also estimated that another 2.5 billion people will urbanize estuaries by 2050. The second reason is that we've paved our world. This map shows where there's at least 10% impervious surface on the planet. And because of urbanization and the link between urbanization and uh, imperviousness and the paving of our watersheds, they have now become compromised in their ability to clean water, produce biodiversity and control flooding. So if we mention the ground, I think it's the first place of intervention that is often overlooked in our design process. Uh, first, it's important that we understand our agency as landscape architects and designers in shaping terrain and topography in an era of climate change. Um, in large quantities, we have been shaping and engineering artificial terrain or fill, uh, which is sort of the most fundamental of all landscapes and a precursor to any development land itself. Um, and in a time where these coastal conditions, associated activities and abutting settlements are especially vulnerable to climate change, this process of coastal land reclamation for urban real estate development has become a profound challenge. To many surprise, sand is actually the second most consumed natural resource on the planet after freshwater. And as only, um, as, as only the sand that has been weathered by water versus air uh, is compatible for development, while the abundant desert uh, sand, which has been withered by wind and made round is rendered useless for concrete uh, and cement. 40 billion tons of sand a year go into urban development. That's twice the amount of sediment carried by all the world's rivers combined. And seemingly infinite, it has now become a scarce resource as called out by the United Nations uh, in 2014. China alone consumed more of this resource. They made more concrete in the last three years as the US has in the last 100. Think about all the dams, all the bridges, all the ports, all the airports, all the roads, all the, all the buildings, all the glass that has gone into urban development. Um, China has consumed more of it in the last three years than the US has in the last 100. So if we think about this rate of paving the planet and how quickly we are changing it from a dynamic system to a static one, um, it's really important to remember our agency within this process. And this is becoming such an issue that in 2019, the UN released a sand and sustainability report for environmental governance. Uh, so the book um, and some of this research, which this is a kind of preamble to some of the ideas that I'll be sharing later, um, it was really important to begin to 
reclaim, if you will, <laughs> the process of land reclamation and really understand as landscape architects, what can we do and how can we intervene in this process? Um, and the role of kind of these different global conglomerates and their associated technologies that are shaping and reshaping so much of our earth. It's really important to remember that this is a huge industry, the dredging, the uh, moving of sediment and the creation of the ground of terrain is something that is really uh, a global um, moneymaker. And the global, globally, the kind of success of projects that have been built on these reclaimed lands have proven to be variable. In some parts, the cost of reclamation has not added up to the value of the original master plan, leaving behind acres of undeveloped plots like these ones in China. Um, these are drone footage that I took uh, in uh, the Tianjin area near Bohai Bay, south of Beijing. So China reclaimed 3,000 square kilometers of land and expanded its coastline by almost 2,000 kilometers in the last four years. This resulted in the reduction of 50% of China's coastal plains and wetlands. And we all know that these coastal plains or wetlands are not just important for biodiversity, but they're the first line of shoreline defense from things like storm surge um, and uh, saltwater intrusion. And as this practice continues today, there, we're now uh, artificial terrain is being constructed at a rate of 700 square kilometers per year. So this book um, kind of began to take these projects and begin to analyze them uh, through a series of matrices and indices to understand their viability. I just want to note that at the bottom right hand corner of the screen, you'll see Manhattan as a scale comparison and as a reference. So these are all projects in China specifically that have been built on reclaimed land. And the Atlas, which is this book uh, that I shared the cover with, um, expands to include global case studies that range in age, size, and scope. Um, from uh, prehistoric eras to some of the things that we see today. And to understand the paradox facing coastal cities where we know that waterfronts continue to be prime real estate, but they're also the most vulnerable to flooding and have the most issues, we continue to kind of build out into our waterways everywhere on the planet. So this kind of paradox becomes an interesting place for us to intervene in. And as I mentioned, reclamation is not a new practice, and almost every city has reshaped its coastlines, but some did it better than others, especially when um, landscape architects are involved. So I'm going to take you back here to Boston, to the Back Bay area of Boston, which was once this noxious tidal swamp. Uh, the sewage water infiltrated this area and created a serious health problem. So by 1877, Boston City Council authorized the acquisition of the land in low-lying areas to create a park, especially in this most toxic part of the Back Bay. It's important to remember that this area was slated to become a park, was identified as part of the larger metropolitan park system for Greater Boston uh, that was pr proposed by Charles Elliott, also a landscape architect by the time in the late 19th century. It's important to remember that, that in that time and in that era, there was no such thing as a planning profession separate from landscape architecture. And landscape architects were acting as these kind of holistic comprehensive planners that were organizing and planning the metropolitan region as an integrated uh, holistic way from parkways to transportation system to where the water should go to where density should be uh, targeted. And so uh, this area of the emerald necklace was part of this, uh, sorry, the back bay was part of this emerald necklace, the larger system uh, that uh, this tidal swamp was connected to. Um, and so by 1875, there was this proposal, and remember this area was all built on fill, on reclaimed land, on area that used to be a tidal marsh, but it was very noxious and dirty and just very unsanitary. So Frederick Law Olmsted, uh, argued, and he was on the jury for this competition that was being proposed to create the stormwater park, which itself, if you think about it, was a radical idea at the time. He argued against a conventional masonry storage basin and instead, instead insisted on this radical proposition of juxtaposing an artificial salt marsh within the city. And he said, it would be novel, certainly in labored urban grounds, and there may be a momentary question of its dignity and appropriateness, but this uh, development of this park is within a direct, uh, it's in direct association with the original conditions of the locality and an adaptation to the needs of a dense community. So this is a quote where he even used the word adaptation that we know is really important as part of the climate resilience language. <laughs> 
Uh, so Olmsted devised the plan that would solve the drainage problem as well as transform the Back Bay area into a hydrological public park. Again, this was really revolutionary for its time. Olmsted proposed a landscape that had the same visual characteristics of the original marsh. However, this was not a restoration project, he insisted. The defense were not trying to restore back the original condition, but instead create this new fluctuating living system. And it required massive construction efforts to stabilize this immense area. And this area was graded with extreme precision with contours that were specified by the Olmsted plan. And then by 1895, the park portions of the back bays were, was completed. The aesthetic of the fence was wild and the vegetation ranged from brackish grasses to ornamental trees. And even though there was a fear of this wild aesthetic was gonna sort of deter the bourgeois of Victorian Boston at the time, his strategy ultimately proved to be very successful as some of Boston's most celebrated institutions like the modern uh, Museum of Fine Arts, and there's a Bella Gardner uh, residence relocated to this area of the fence. Um, and again, it's important to remember that this was going hand in hand with the filling or the reclamation of the entire Back Bay neighborhood, which took another six years to complete to create this Back Bay development to the north and east. And this new infill included both commercial properties and streets, as well as a new park that provided a new urban surface for a planned urban district. And as I, as you recall, like Olmsted designed all of it. He designed the density of the buildings, the setbacks, the heights. He, he as the landscape architect, really created this correlation between where the buildings needed to go and their height and depth from the groundwater to the relocation of water, um, sorry, open space and boulevards, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, he also ensured that there would be several entrances that reached into the main uh, open ways and made sure that this was comments, that this was not a private, the private properties did not back into this, that this was a kind of central system that had a public uh, facing side to it that was really critical. So if you look at this kind of cross section of this area, again, that was mostly built on reef reclaimed land and designed by Olmsted, you'll see a system of redundant pieces of uh, urban infrastructure and green space. The Esplanade Park along the Charles River, which kind of acted as one line of defense from protecting the neighborhood from flooding from the riverside. Uh, the Fence, Commonwealth Avenue, which was, again, not merely just a sequence of open spaces, but these performative landscape armatures that enabled the construction of an urban district. So all the flood defenses doubled as parkland to the, and had cleansing properties of stormwater wetlands. Um, and all of these things are now kind of the characteristics of contemporary resilient design. One of the few sort of contemporary precedents of a project this size is, is right here in Toronto's Portland um, and the redevelopment of the Lower Downlands. Uh, the winning competition entry by Michael Van Valkenburg and Associates for the redesign of the Portland dis deploys a very similar and complex kind of comprehensive landscape based strategy for the artificial renaturalization of the Don River. And again, this is an area built on reclaimed land at the mouth of a, of a river where the landscape architect was really pushing the, the form and the morphology and the transformation of this terrain. Um, they use landforms, planting and buffering strategies as both to protect from flooding, but also, which is really important to instigate future urban development. So now that uh, this new floodable art read doesn't just act as a public amenity and a habitat for wildlife, but it's truly a kind of landscape-based infrastructure for the building of this new um, island in a part of the city that has been dormant for a really long time and undevelopable and derelict. And if you recall um, Olmsted's quote, juxtaposing the marsh, uh, marsh and city um, on artificial terrain. Again, this idea is no different than some of the projects that are happening upstream like Corktown Common, where the flood protection landform and berm um, also enable the development of the West Donlands on the other side. So by giving the river the space to flood, it's not just a kind of eco infrastructural strategy, but a key catalyst for future development and investment on the water's edge. Um, I like kind of jumping back and forth in time because it's really fascinating at some point to see how so many of these ideas are enduring and a lot of these strategies kind of find their way back in time and in history.
uh, when the city of Toronto's Island Committee, this is a drawing also by the Olmsted office, um, and when the city of Toronto's Island Committee was considering redevelop redevelopment of the Toronto Harbor, in 1902, they hired the Olmsted office to come up with a plan uh, for the placement of waterways, roadways, and bridges. Um, and much of the project is sort of designed in section, which is really interesting, and included these landforms that use the dredge materials uh, from the lake to create breakwaters, as well as a series of protected beaches that acted as buffer space, a promenade, and a terrace tree boulevard that was followed by this kind of dike-like landform that had a whole lot of carriageways and other circulation mechanisms on them. And then when these landforms are aggregated, they acted as a kind of redundant buffer of infrastructural networks that connected the waterfront to the city and made sure that the island doesn't erode. Um, if some of you can recognize this area, this would be uh, the, near the QEW and the Queensway where the GO trains currently uh, run, pretty close to where Sunnyside Beach is. So this is a section of that general zone. Again, the, today the TRCA is proposing a kind of very similar strategy to protect the islands from further flooding, where you see these series of redundant landforms um, and kind of topographic variations on these areas to not just necessarily stabilize them, but to also couple them with other functions and programs. So in essence, uh, we now, when we're shaping future terrains, I just want us to think that we have a set of toolkits that will allow us to assess things like risk in ways that we were never able to do before, including liquefaction, erosion, and flooding. Um, and we're at the CLR trying to use things like generative design where we can now deploy new tech te techniques that optimize cut and fill operations. So we're testing uh, the use of some different software like Dynamo uh, from Autodesk and um, other sort of grasshopper inputs to try to think of how could we design new terrains that maximize land value and decreases flooding? And what does that kind of begin to look like? Um, and then perhaps begin to insert within them new live feed data such as currents, ocean currents, tides, salinity, pollution levels, um, to create these sort of new landform types for urban development uh, that respond to, again, flood risk, land value, and access to infrastructure, as well as slope. Um, this means uh, we can design new terrains that are more responsive to gradients of inundation. So if you think of how we built today, we built with this very strong binary of wet and dry, land and water. There's no threshold in between that is designed to allow for water to infiltrate and allow for certain urban uh, typologies to exist within them. Um, so the, the project here sorts of starts to think of associating new building types, open spaces and infrastructure provisions that take on this gradient of inundation, that takes on flexibility and indeterminacy as part of the formula and not a binary of wet and dry. So here you can start to see this novel kind of idea of an urban transect that dissolves that binary and imagines appropriate uses and building typologies that are responsive to this uh, water, to the kind of water uh, levels, as well as the uh, soil conditions and other parameters that otherwise would have been ignored in a wet and dry binary of land reclamation that we see today. So the next phase of this deployment of buildings, parks, and infrastructure um, are assembled and inter interrelated to increase the city's resilience. And here I'm going to focus a bit more closely on a project that I've been working on for a while um, and to kind of bring some of these ideas back to a specific uh, geography. Um, in November of 2016, this octopus made its way into a parking garage in Miami Beach and it instantly became a social media sensation. A king tide flooding event, uh, which is a kind of seasonal phenomena that is brought upon when the moon is the closest to the Earth's orbit, carried the creature deep into the urban fabric of the city. And because water levels in the Biscayne Bay near Miami have risen so much in the last four years, salt water from the sea and the animals that it carries with it has been infiltrating deep into the city and its infrastructure, creating the sunny day floods. Um, and a recent study found that since 2006, high tide related flooding has soared by 400%. These are just some photos I took a couple of years ago in Fort Lauderdale during a king tide event. The sun was out, there was no storm, 
everything was perfect. It was a perfectly calm day, but because water levels have risen so much, the ocean is literally bubbling from below, their, from below the ground and uh, from their sewer systems. Um, Nadia, can I just check in? I'm, are you still there with me? Can you guys all hear me properly? Is everything working well? Everything's good. I can hear you. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, because I can't see your faces, so I just want to make sure I'm not talking into the abyss. We're all, we're all, all good. Right. Okay, perfect. All right, so with nearly uh, 20 million residents, South Florida is one of North America's fastest growing urban regions. And I think this is an important thing to think about, that this part of the continent is urbanizing really fast. It's growing. Um, and so it's sometimes easy to forget that Miami, Fort Lauderdale, West Palm Beach, all of those uh, cities are in fact surrounded by water from three sides. The Everglades to the west, which is this huge tidal uh, swamp that is their underlying uh, geologic condition, the Atlantic to the east, and the Biscayne water aquifer just below their feet. So they definitely live in a terra sort of firma, <laughs> as, as I mentioned, uh, a ground that is neither wet nor dry, but has been and always will be in a state of constant flux. Yeah, in South Florida, like many of the estuary regions around the world, this underlying landscape remains a place to be feared. This is this really uh, satirical website that talks about how the Everglades is just filled with pythons and alligators and mosquitoes. It's a place to really distance ourselves from, both culturally and physically. It kind of rains blood, ra blood rain, and the temperature there is 150 degrees with 150% humidity. So it's, there's this kind of mental idea that this landscape that we're inhabiting is something that is kind of counter to the environments we would want to be in. So in addition to the psyche, over the past 60 years, the Army Corps of Engineers has built over 35 miles of levee, levees and over 2,000 hydraulic pumping stations to drain a metropolitan region of over 15,000 square kilometers every single day creating this impressive expanses of infrastructure that go on for miles. So imagine we're draining 15,000 square kilometers every single day from our urban environment in order to pretend to be living in it. <laughs> and so in doing so, they've reshaped hydrological flows at scales that were never seen possible. In order to enable this type of urbanization that is seemingly detached from its context, there's a sort of repetitive insular private residential developments that sort of stretch in, in indefinitely. Uh, this is just the taste of the typical fabric of South Florida. Um, an early 20th century Florida land speculator famously once said, I bought land by the acre, I bought land by the foot, but by God, I've never bought land by the gallon. So over the past century, Floridians have put an estimated $100 billion worth of properties below sea level that will be below sea level by 2030. Um, and I put this little slide that one of my students put together because they were really mesmerized that, you know, someone kind of drew, designed and built these things, but that many thousands are flocking to buy them and live in them, live in them living in them, knowing how much uh, this geography is at risk. And while scientists have kind of been sounding the alarms for years, um, papers like this one every single year get published confirming that while most of the world is in trouble, Florida is in even deeper trouble than other parts of the continent. And yet this is what many architects <clears throat> and planners do in Florida. You know, you've got fancy glass towers designed by star architects like Zaha Hadid and others. And you've got these kind of faux European plazas uh, designed by, you know, uh, many of the kind of commercial mall developments and other um, kind of real estate, uh, uh, real estate driven, market driven uh, uh, forces. So again, beyond this idea of the kind of speculative real estate that I was showing you earlier, and because of the growth pressures, many of the urban codification systems, the rules, the guidance, guidelines, the DNA of how these areas are being built, um, rather look at form and decorative things, uh, to be honest, <laughs> than any other things that are systemic and performative, like hydrology, like making space for water to uh, be a kind of part and parcel of the code and DNA of what gets built there. So for example, in a place like Davie, Florida, which is in Broward County, the law there is that all new development have to have a Southwest branch style. 
right? So this is their number one priority. You know, your building's got to look like they are in a Southwest ranch in, you know, near Nevada or New Mexico uh, versus any sort of rule set that maybe did something about on-site water storage, about how you grade, about permeability, about green roofs, about systems that really would allow for this area to adapt to the pressures of climate change and of precipitation. Um, and this is really all enabled by this myth that if you divide the region from its natural context with something like a massive levee, you generate this condition where on one third of the county, you could sort of build anything you want, including those um, Southwest Ranch and uh, so Spain, Spanish revival communities. And then you've got two thirds, which is the Everglades. You're actually divided from those two by this massive levee. Uh, and you've got two coasts on either end, one on the Atlantic side um, and one that's on the west on, and the Everglades on the west, when in reality, they're one singular condition. It's one estuary that goes from east to west. And um, it's really important to note that despite the kind of really terrible political uh, rhetoric where there's a ton of climate denial in South Florida and in other parts of the United States, there's also these incredibly progressive, unique forms of regional governance that have been popping up in those geographies uh, that are dealing specifically with climate change and adaptation, like the Southeast Florida Regional Climate Compact, which was formed in 2010. The four southern east, southeastern counties kind of, in some ways, bypassed the state and created this compact in order to coordinate mitigation and adaptation activities across county lines. And the compact allows local governments to set the agenda for adaptation while providing efficient means for the state and federal agencies to act for technical uh, assistance and support. And so um, I've been working with Broward County uh, for the past four or five years in order to kind of begin to bring in some of this landscape thinking into their planning documents and their urban design manuals. And this relationship has resulted in a series of uh, four design studios that were taught at MIT and UFT between 2013 and 2017, involving some 60 plus students of landscape architecture, architecture, design, planning, as well as some 20 plus um, municipal planners, policymakers, and engineers. And all these studios, I'm just going to share a couple of student projects before uh, I conclude with uh, some of the rules that we're, how, some of the codes that we're giving uh, Broward County, um, because they're in some ways really, they really help inform each other. All of the studios uh, that I showed you earlier started with this idea of an animated analytical mapping exercise where all the students re had to research uh, projects, uh, research the mapping conditions and the transformation of the place as it's never static. All the analysis had to be live, had to include weather patterns, tidal variations, changing water table heights, um, no, sorry, not live, but took in live data, live feed information that never showed a place as one singular condition, but something that is continuously uh, changing and is never really um, in a, a static condition. Um, and also over the last decade, there have been over 60 open call design competitions that we've at least counted that ask interdisciplinary teams to imagine a climate resilient and adaptable future for countless locations all around the and we began to catalog and collect those and categorize them into themes that we begin to point to and understand as foundational principles of contemporary resilient design. And we were able to boil them down into these five strategies or frame frameworks. The first is this idea of connectivity and reading the landscape. The second is open-ended flexibility for program and use. The third is the idea of the landform as a fail-safe and as a buffer. The fourth is the integration of green, blue, and gray infrastructure. And the fifth is this idea of the landscape as a filter. So these frameworks and these ideas seem to also be very much enduring. They repeat themselves in projects that date all the way back to Homestead. And we think are fundamental and are foundational to how landscape architects operate today. So if we scale them up as ideas, and we start to think of how urban codes and how zoning codes, land use codes, um, planning policies, none of them advocate for these things. None of them truly, truly allow or accommodate these concepts to be uh, enacted within them. 
And so uh, as part of the studio, we also ask the students to immerse themselves in the local planning policies and land use codes. I can tell you this was something they all hated. You know, most designers never really want to look at urban codes or urban policies because they're really boring. <laughs> but they're so important because in so many ways, they're the rules and regulations that shape everything that is built out there. Um, and they really haven't changed all that much in the last 50, 60, you know, years. They, they, they really um, haven't had a fundamental shift in how they could be responsive to climate change and other issues. And so the studio, the student project, uh, you know, they were armed with this kind of strong understanding of the context and all its dynamic forces, as well as some of the policy frameworks. And so knowing all these things, the students were asked to imagine uh, more catalytic responsive design moves. Uh, and then once they did that, it was really fascinating because they realized that all their projects would be illegal. <laughs> the policy codes and the zoning codes would never allow them to be innovative the way that they wanna be. So as part of the studio environment, we asked them then to imagine their own codes uh, as a response to their project. Um, and the studio was awarded the 2018 Studio Prize on Sloan Awards. So I'm going to share a quick sample of some of those projects. Um, this project here envisioned a way to make the kind of rural and exurban communities play a major role in the restoration of the Everglades, uh, their ecological health. The students here proposed a toolkit of topographic and fighter remediation strategies for canal infrastructure and site grading to deal with the agricultural pollutants that enter the, uh, uh, the stormwater runoff. So if you could see here, each of the properties, instead of the code, in the building code and the zoning code would require them to grade their site in very specific ways so and plant them with specific plants that then allowed for the water to not leave properties uh, as, as quickly as they would have. But instead, the new code will create these new ditches and swales that were regraded and vegetated and then connected to a larger network. Um, the, this then lengthened the distance between the source of the pollution uh, and the runoff and the Everglades themselves. And in doing so, as much as possible, naturally filter the water along the way. This project here addressed the sunny day flood phenomena by envisioning these new road and canal hybrids in Fort Lauderdale's islands. So many of the uh, subsurface sewers have been corroding over time because of the saltwater intrusion. So many of the lead pipes and all the sort of metal pipe have been, um, have been have bas basically saltwater has corroded them away. And so the government is now in charge and in the process of replacing all those, uh, all those pipes. And instead these students said, as soon as you're digging up the road, how about we imagine this new road canal infrastructural hybrid? Uh, and they proposed this VIA network. And these VIA networks would then uh, be appropriate in size. They would mitigate the tidal floodwater and create this new alternative pedestrian oriented circulation network that not only kind of provided shade, but extended the public realm through the sort of tiered system that filled with water when needed and however, and in other ways that might have not been appropriate or possible in a typical road section. This project was, you know, in some ways really amazingly straightforward, but in, in so many ways, the county thought it was groundbreaking, which is that you might establish a relationship between topographic elevation and building density, height and massing. So the code that they invented uh, forced a correlation between how tall a building can be and its distance from the water table, as well as its form. And in some areas like um, along the Highway 1 Ridge, which is the naturally high occurring ridge in Broward County, they said that all the buildings could just be your, your height of your building and its use had to have a correlation with, with a kind of groundwater condition, as well as its solar orientation had to be tilted to maximize shade and passive cooling onto the public realm. Lastly, this project saw the potentials of creating a kind of new west facing shoreline for the county along the Everglades coast. Remember that's where that big berm, that big levee sits in. And they thought of um, ways that they could thicken and inhabit these series of redundant berms and levees to create this sort of new uh, linear city um, along the western edge of the county. So that instead of you know having again this binary of nothing is built here, everything is built there, that the city itself would occupy the space 
with these new amazing building typologies and open spaces that need to be reimagined where you integrate the infrastructure and the berming and the programming all into this one new um, urban sort of uh, linear landscape. Lastly, as I mentioned, you know, there was this really important ways that we as designers should rethink and reconsider codes, uh, urban codes, and how we could institutionalize resilient design by making these sort of hyper localized and nuanced systems. Um, this timeline in front of you is 300 years worth of urban codes uh, and standards that were strung together in this uh, visual timeline. Uh, this was a part of an exhibition that I put together at MIT a few years ago. And the goal of the exhibition was to demonstrate how urban codes were reflective of the challenges of their time, but that they have also been active agents in shaping our cities for the last two centuries. You know, everything from the tools of early land surveyors to the first sewage guidelines and nuisance ordinances, from neo-traditional form-based co co codes to uh, the universally adopted land-based classification standards. Um, and the tools of rational planning that have been armed with these judicial powers have been shaping the North American territory unchallenged and marginally altered for well over two centuries. Uh, some of these codes like the land-based classification standards that planners typically use remain very powerful and ubiquitous. Again, these kind of planometric projective representations of our cities are extremely powerful because they're in fact a piece of legislative law where there is a, almost a direct relationship between what is drawn and what is built. Again, even in places as dynamic and as complex as the Floridian swamps. So that with a T-square and a triangle, finally the municipal engineer could without the slightest training as either an architect nor a sociologist plan a metropolis and proliferate the continent. In essence, our agency as designers is also greatly diminished when the majority of our cities are in fact zoned and not planned. Again, and it's important to remember that underlying that kind of comprehensive planning and zoning that I mentioned earlier was this idea that we have the capacity to anticipate and shape the future. And we can trace, uh, again, this faith uh, to methods of scientific inquiry that prevailed in the first half of the 20th century, where we kind of had this concern, these overlapping concerns from how a city should look like, to what are the living conditions, to the environment, to how we would be more efficient from an engineering point of view. And you can see them overlapping and crisscrossing over time. And every time that there's a pressure, some sort of pressure from uh, whether it be pollution, whether it is climate change, whether it is housing, you start to see this idea where designers need to kind of break out of their silos um, and their concerns and become go from autonomous designers to collaborators. And again, this is why I think it's really important for us to really start to think of how our propositions could be more instrumental and less uh, kind of uh, inward looking. Um, and so this last project that I want to show you here kind of takes this idea to think of, you know, even if we're not on the coast, like even if we're not working along the water, there are ways that we can start to think um, not just in terms of retrofits, but in new developments. How can we take such reductive measures that often, um, you know, when we see controls like green belts or growth boundaries and conservation lands, we create another binary between what is urban and its surrounding environment. We say, you can build whatever you want on one side, but you can't build anything else on the other side. Again, I know it's not that straightforward, but we've been doing this over years. So um, this is just an agricultural field on an edge of a city. It could be anywhere. Um, in this case, it's, it's, in, it's in Argentina in the Pampas, but it could be um, any geography on the planet. You kind of see these little white dots are cattle grazing seasonal wetlands. Once we zone that same area as single family residential, and we allow the kind of normative subdivision building process to take over, we, that seasonal wetland depression that used to kind of fill up with water, get the cattle to, gets the cattle to fertilize it, it creates a sort of robust uh, ecosystem, now becomes the static wetland, sorry, static stormwater pond. And you've got this housing subdivision that has to adhere to its geometry and its form in a way that is mostly driven by a kind of real estate proposition versus anything larger and more exciting. So um, there is an idea here is if we begin, if we can begin to innovate land subdivision by instead of using uh, 
the administration of street layouts and associated grading and drainage as the first uh, move, what if we start thinking of topographic manipulation and water flow as the very first act? What if land subdivision had to adhere even in the most localized, smallest way to stormwater drainage and other kind of topographic variations? Could we then start to associate building uh, types um, and other things that responded to uh, soil quality, access to infrastructure, and in doing so, beginning to dictate land and use. So everything from how the building floor area ratios, FAR, their foundations, their setback, their density, and their height emerge as a reflection of this kind of physical terrain and context. And while this might look like a linear transect from dry to wet, once you apply it on a site, it becomes more reflective of a kind of specific nuanced site condition. So this is a kind of overlay zoning, if you will, that I'm imagining and inventing that relates uh, very closely to the landscape. Um, and here's just one permutation of what is possible where you can start to register the density and building orientation and open spaces as a reflection of hyper-localized topography, as well as decentralized water flows um, that have a correlation with where the open space network goes. And just to zoom in uh, in a little bit more detail, you see how it's not a linear transect, but the real concentrations of densities are a registration of localized uh, topographic um, uh, uh, conditions. So again, this is kind of both a code that offers a sense of precision in terms of what can be built and where, but at the same time becomes very generous in offering flexible open spaces for indeterminate forces like water and other kind of uh, green, um, green networks to, to, to dig into it. This is just another iteration here that I worked on with a student where they began to think of inundation and open space ratios, the clustering cut and cut and fill operation to dictate land subdivision standards and land uses that creates a very different type of suburban greenfield development than what you would typically see built today. And these images show this kind of suburban variation of open spaces that integrate fully into their landscape surroundings. Um, and they are more linked to the nuances of the hydrological cycle. So in a kind of imaginary world, the cattle could still sort of graze in seasonal pools that are protected for agriculture. And you can see this in sort of direct contrast to the status quo of the suburban development just to the south of the site. So again, just jumping back quickly to the other side of Florida to just point to why some of these things are really problematic. So on the right, on the left hand side here, you see the current land use zoning map for the Hollywood area of Broward County. Um, and on the right, you see the two feet and six feet flooding uh, flood projections for the same area for 2060. And I just want to remind you that six feet is not that much. It's like a sub, you know, a foot long sub. <laughs> two foot long subs. Um, and you can kind of begin to imagine that this, why are we still zoning future areas of flooding when we know that they are vulnerable? So why do we continue to zone an area with a future residential land use knowing that its future is kind of doomed as well? So again, beginning to look very deep into the sort of administrative planning tools, you start to see how there's very little in the code, as I mentioned earlier, to enable and allow for indeterminacy and for some type of flexibility to take hold within the fabric of the city. So in collaboration with the MIT Urban Risk Lab, I've been working on developing this platform that we're calling Flux.Land that allows residents and officials to better understand the relationship between built form urban codes and their in underlying environmental conditions in real time. Um, and so using descriptions of ecomorphological attributes such as soil permeability, base flood elevation, seasonal water table heights, and storm surge, we began utilizing algorithms to identify landform classes with distinct environmental risk profiles. And the result is a series of discrete zones that can form, inform targeted interventions and direct future built form and zoning codes. And here you see the difference this land use categorization process produces. On the left, again, is the 2060 Broward County, Florida land use zoning map. And on the right is our proposed land use clustering method, which takes into account environmental conditions and risk. So the series of clusters with associated land use densities and building types are really based on and connected to a kind of factored in uncertainty, if you will. 
Um, so we're working on zooming in a little closer to districts where you can kind of select parameters on a slider bar to identify parcel level information, like how much water storage potential there is, what is the lot coverage, the building age, its value, its lot coverage. And so as water levels whoops, begin to fluctuate, um, as water levels begin to fluctuate, these same clusters begin to serve as productive uh, infrastructural purposes, as well as ecosystem services or development when needed. And they generate responsive scenarios that are linked to more calibrated parameters, inputs, and projections. So we can start from an area that is zoned for one possible future outcome to one that generates more responsive scenario-driven um, urban proposals. Lastly, um, I just wanted to share with you this one drawing that we've been working on. It's a seven foot long section that has embedded, embedded within it uh, 50 or so resilience and adaptation strategies and prototypes from around the world. Um, it includes strategies that are infrastructural, typological and spatial at different scales. It's on an imaginary estuary transect that goes from an ocean to a high ridge and a high ground. Um, and new and integrated infrastructural public spaces that are both performative, but also civic and recreational, um, and that have a kind of symbiotic relationship with their landscape. Uh, the section also extends out into the suburban fabric, as well as um, logistical, agricultural, and exurban ones that also warrant new design moves with a kind of ultimate goal uh, to highlight the needs of urban forms that sort of integrate the landscape as the primary driver for resilient urbanism. Um, I'm going to end by quoting J.B. Jackson, uh, the landscape laureate, who astonishingly spoke about climate change to an audience of urbanists and designers almost 50 years ago. He wisely observed that the beaches along the Gulf and the Atlantic are doomed to destruction. They are remorselessly eaten away by the sea. Geographers tell us that we're being driven inward by the rising ocean at the rate of one vertical foot a century. And so when asked about the future tra trajectory of the design professions and changing the environment, he responded, these are some of my reasons for believing that the natural environment cannot be saved in its present form. It can be summed up by saying that everything conspires against the permanent form, against the permanent static condition. The natural world around us needs, we need to embrace change and uncertainty by designing for it. So at the end, it's kind of important to remember that in this extreme age of uncertainty that has been brought upon by the climate crisis, we should first break down our professional silos. And then we need to question this binary of wet and dry land and water and dissolve them into design gradients that respond to these uncertain futures. Um, I sometimes like to end with this image because um, many think that these ideas are fantasies or something like the Green D New Deal is not possible. Uh, Bloomberg Business recently shared this UN report putting the estimated of the dealing with all those adaptation strategies as $300 billion. Uh, that's the money needed to stop the rise in greenhouse gases and buy up to 20 years of time to fix global warming. This is just for reference, the equivalent of the GDP of Chile or the world's military spending every 60 days. So every 60 days we spend that much money on the military or just the net worth of three people, Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. So thank you. Huh.